Hi everyone, welcome. Today we'll be reviewing blood types, blood composition, white blood cells, and hemostasis. Let's get into it. Blood composition is referring to the elements that make up blood. So if I have a sample of blood and we put it in this machine called a centrifuge, the blood will get spun around at a super high speed and this will loosen the components of the blood and they will settle separate from each other. Once settled, we'll notice that the blood has two major components, the plasma and the formed elements. Let's take a magnified look at the formed elements first. 45% of the entire blood is formed elements, and these include the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets. Your red blood cells take up about 40 to 44% of the formed elements. You will find them settled down at the bottom of the vial because they are the most dense of all the properties in the blood. An important component of red blood cells is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that works kind of like a bus to transfer gases around the body. Technically, it transfers carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and oxygen, but oxygen is the most relevant. As red blood cells age and mature, they lose their nucleus in the center, and this makes room for the cell to carry more oxygen. The more hemoglobin your red blood cells have, the more oxygen they are able to carry around in the body. So if a person has low hemoglobin levels, you will most likely find that this person has symptoms associated with low oxygen levels. When hemoglobin has released its oxygen, it is able to pick up hydrogen ions. So hemoglobin acts like a buffer and plays an important role in acid-base balance. Also, red blood cells are not able to repair themselves. So when they age, they must die off and be replaced. After they are born and they leave the bone, red bone marrow, they live for approximately 120 days before they are broken down and disposed of by the liver and the spleen. Red blood cell production is is called erythropoietin, which is triggered by low oxygen levels in the blood. Another layer that sits on top of the red blood cells is called the buffy coat. This is composed of white blood cells and platelets. It makes up less than 1% of the formed elements. Platelet's main function is to assist in hemostasis by forming a platelet plug and beginning the clotting cascade. Also, it releases serotonin at the beginning of hemostasis, and this serotonin causes vasoconstriction. These platelets are also known as thrombocytes. White blood cells prevent infection and invasion of harmful substances in the body, but this is something we'll follow up and go into depth later. 55% of the blood is plasma, so what is not plasma are the formed elements. Plasma consists of water, proteins, ions, gases, and waste product. 92% of the plasma is water, about 7% is proteins, and this includes albumin, fibrogens, and globulins. And the remaining less than 1% consists of ions, gases, and waste products. So just to sum up, 55% of the blood is made out of plasma and 45% is made out of formed elements, 1% of which is the buffy coat and this consists of your white blood cells and your platelets. So let's go ahead and move on and take a magnified look at the white blood cells. These white blood cells are also called leukocytes and their main purpose is to protect the body from infection. There are several types of white blood cells and they are mainly differentiated by their size, shape of their nucleus, and the ability to see granules in their cytoplasm when we look at them under a microscope. When staining a white blood cell, we use the right stain, and this will uncover the granules in the cell cytoplasm and make it more or less visible to us. So if we stain a white blood cell and look at it under a microscope, and we are able to clearly see granules in the cytoplasm, this white blood cell is referred to as a granulocyte. Now, if we are unable to clearly see the granules in the cytoplasm, then this white blood cell is referred to as a a granulocyte. So just add an A in front of granulocyte and that means without granules. So under leukocytes we have two main types, the granulocytes and the agranulocytes. Under granulocytes we have neutrophils, 
They are the most abundant white blood cell and most aggressive. They undergo phagocytosis, which is a process in which they surround, ingest, and destroy potential harmful substances. Next, we have the eosinophils, which increase in number when allergies are present, and they also defend against parasites. Next, we have the basophils, which are involved in allergic reaction. They, are al they also release heparin, which prevents the blood from clotting. Now looking at our A granulocytes. Lymphocytes are the most abundant white blood cell. These differ from other white blood cells in that they develop and mature in the lymphoid tissue, and they circulate in the lymphatic system. Monocytes are the largest of all the white blood cells. They also participate in the process of phagocytosis and have the ability to turn into macrophages. They are often found when chronic illness is present in the body. And there we have it, the white blood cells. Now, the main functions you must remember about the white blood cells is that they clear the body of foreign material that is potentially harmful. They also clear out any cellular debris and metabolic byproducts that the body itself produces. So in other words, they clear out any harmful material that, it, that comes into the body, but they also clear out any waste product that is developed in the body and they take it out. And of course, you must remember phagocytosis is extremely relevant to the white blood cells and the leukocytes that engage in phagocytosis are the neutrophils and the monocytes or macrophages. Moving on to hemostasis. Hemostasis is a process that prevents too much blood loss from the circulatory system. Hemostasis is activated when there is a tear in a blood vessel or there is a foreign object in the inner layer of the blood vessel. By that I mean, for example, if there's a needle in your blood vessel from, let's just say, a blood draw, then this needle touching the inner part of the blood vessel will trigger hemostasis. So there are three steps to hemostasis. The first step is vasoconstriction. This is when pla platelets stimulate serotonin release and serotonin causes smooth muscle to contract. The smooth muscle will contract in the blood vessels and cause a decrease in blood flow. The second step is formation of a platelet plug. Now, this includes a few smaller steps. First, platelets floating around in the blood will stop at the damaged site and stick to the exposed collagen. The platelets will eventually form a plug. Next, these platelets will release the prothrombin activator. The prothrombin activator, along with the help of vitamin K, will then turn prothrombin into thrombin. Thrombin will then convert fibrinogen into fibrin. Fibrinogen is soluble in blood and fibrin is insoluble in blood. Next, in step three, fibrin being insoluble will be able to reinforce the clot with its mesh-like fibers. And these are the three steps of hemostasis. So finishing off with our last topic, blood types. First and foremost, we must understand two important vocabulary words associated with blood types. The first word is antigen. Antigens are proteins that rest on the surface of our red blood cells and they are what determine our blood type. So I'm going to represent antigens with these flags because antigens are basically what the blood is representing. So if we have a blood cell and it has an antigen with an A on it, then this is type A blood. If we have a red blood cell with, an, with a B antigen on it, then this is referred to as blood type B. If we have both A and B antigen, then this is blood type AB. If we have no antigens on our blood cell, like zero antigens, then this is referred to as blood type O. The next vocabulary word is antibody. Antibody basically is part of the immune system and it attacks anything harmful or incompatible with our blood. So our, our antigens will tell the antibodies what is not compatible with our blood. For example, if we have blood type A, the antigen is A and this antigen will tell the antibody to fight off any B antigens. If we have a B antigen represented here with a flag with a B on it, 
That means this red blood cell is compatible with B. So it won't fight off anything else with B, but it will fight off anything with an A. So the antigen will tell the antibody, hey, if any A's come around, you must fight them off. If any B's come around, they're perfectly okay. So here, B is our antigen and A is our antibody. In blood type AB, this blood is representing both A and B. So it doesn't need to fight anyone. It's cool with everyone. So it will have no defense. It will have no army. Or in other words, it will have no antibodies. In blood type O, this blood has no flags. It represents no one, which means it fights everyone. So here, blood type O has no antigens, but it does have an army of antibodies to fight against everyone, meaning fighting against both A and B. So if A comes around or B comes around, blood type O is going to fight against it. Okay, so now we understand how antigens and antibodies work together. Let's look at compatibilities in receiving blood, starting off with blood type A. Who can blood type A receive blood from? This will be determined by who it fights off. What are blood type A's antibodies? Type B, right? So blood A type will have antibodies that are against B, anti-B antibodies. So let's just say another blood cell comes along and it's also a type A. Will it be received or rejected by blood type A? Received, right? Because A will not fight off A. So what if blood type B comes along? Will blood type A receive it? No, it will reject it because blood type A is surrounded by B antibodies. And when those antibodies see that B flag, they will attack it. What if blood type AB comes along? It will also be rejected because although it has an A flag, it also has a B flag and those B antigens will be attacked. So what about if blood type O comes around? Will it be received or will it be rejected? Well, it has no flags on it, so it will not be a threat to blood type A. The antibodies in blood type A will not have anything that triggers an attack, so blood type O will be accepted. Here we have blood type B with B antigens and A antibodies floating around it to protect it. If blood type A comes around, will it be accepted or rejected? It will be rejected and attacked by the A antibodies. If blood type B comes around, will it be accepted or rejected? Accepted. If blood type AB comes around, will it be accepted or rejected? Rejected, because the antibodies will see those A flags as a threat and fight the blood type AB. If O comes around, will it be accepted or rejected? Accepted. It is seen as no threat because it has no flags. Now let's look at blood type AB. Because AB represents both A and B, it has no army to fight against them. So if blood type A comes around it, it will accept it. If blood type B comes around it, it will accept it. If blood type AB comes around it, it will accept it. And if blood type O comes around it, it will accept it. AB no is known as the universal receiver and will accept all blood types. Okay, lastly, we have blood type O. Blood type O has both A and B antibodies. So anything flagged with an A or a B will be rejected and blood type O will basically fight it. So if an A comes along, it will be rejected. If a B comes along, it will be rejected. If an A, B comes along, it will be rejected. But if an O comes along, it will be accepted. Blood type O will only receive from blood type O. I want to emphasize that giving and receiving blood are not the same. So for example, blood type A can give to AB, but it cannot receive from AB. So we just looked over all the compatibilities with blood receiving. Now let's look at blood giving. So here we're working with blood type A. Which blood type can A give to? Basically, A will give to those who also represent A and have an A antigen or flag in this case. So can it give to an A? Yes, it can. Can it give to a B? No, it can't. Can it give to an AB? Yes, it can. Can it give to an O? 
No, it can't. So blood type A can only give to A and AB. Here we're working with blood type B. Blood type B will only be able to give blood to others with the B antigen, or in this case, the B flag. So can it give to A? No, it can't. Can it give to B? Yes, it can. Can it give to AB? Yes, it can. Can it give to O? No, it can't. So blood type B can only give to B and AB. Now we're working with blood type AB. AB will be able to give to any blood type representing AB. And that's AB together, not A or B. So will it be able to give to A? No, it won't. Will it be able to give to B? No, it won't. Will it be able to give to AB? Yes, it will. Will it be able to give to O? No, it won't. So blood type AB can only give to blood type AB. Lastly, we're working with blood type O. O can give to everyone. So O can give to A, O can give to B, O can give to AB, and O can give to O. It can give to everyone because it represents no one. It has no flags or antigens that will trigger other blood types to see it as a threat. Blood type O is known as the universal donor. Okay, so that wraps up the compatibilities of giving blood. Lastly, I'd just like to explain the RH factor, which is also known as the rhesus factor. This is a protein that is found on the surface of red blood cells. Blood either has the RH factor or it doesn't have the RH factor. If it does have the RH factor, then this blood is known as positive. If the blood does not have the RH factor, then this is known as negative. A positive RH factor can give to another positive and it can receive from a negative or a positive. Now, a negative RH factor can give to a negative or a positive, but it can only receive from another negative. I've made this quick chart as a quick review or guide. If you want, you can screenshot it and use it for your studies. So at the top, I have the blood types, A, B, A, B, and O. And then to the left, I have if they're an their antigens, their antibodies, what they're able to give and what they're able to receive. So looking at the top, starting with the antigens. Blood type A will have A antigens, blood type B will have B antigens, blood type AB will have AB antigens, and blood type O will have no antigens at all. That means that blood type A will have B antibodies, blood type B will have A antibodies, blood type AB will have no antibodies at all, blood type O will have both A and B antibodies which means that blood type A will be able to give to A and AB, blood type B will be able to give to B and AB, and blood type AB will be only be able to give to AB. Blood type O will be able to give to everyone. It is a universal donor. And this leaves receiving. Blood type A can receive blood from A and O, blood type B can receive from B and O, Blood type AB can receive blood from everyone. It is a universal receiver. And lastly, blood type O can only receive from O. And this concludes this video. Thank you guys for sticking around and watching. I hope you learned something new. Until next time, guys.